All right, welcome everyone to our uh, first virtual town hall uh, meeting of the year. Uh, let's, uh, uh, Jessica's helping me with, Jessica Hines is helping me with slides today. And so let's go ahead and pull the slide deck up and we will get started. Our agenda today, uh, let's go to that. Yes. Uh, we're going to talk for a few minutes about, uh, uh, last year and some of the really good things that we accomplished at the university. Then I'm going to uh, turn it over to David Hall, who's been uh, managing our uh, COVID-19 response for the last year and a half, and he's going to uh, focus on uh, where we are now, and that will include a vaccination update as well as fall mitigation strategies. And then I'll have some uh, final comments about uh, where we are in the pandemic in the fall semester. Uh, we'll announce our uh, employee incentive winners, and then we'll move into Q&A. Our goal is to take no more than 30 minutes to go through the presentation so that we have uh, at least an hour uh, for questions. And so speaking of questions, let's go to the next slide. Um, Remember to use the Q&A feature of Zoom to ask questions. We have at least three people working to sort questions. Uh, remember, you can vote up questions that you like to make sure that they are asked. Uh, please do not just put comments in the Q&A because it makes the people working to get the questions asked, uh, makes their job more difficult. Um, if your question doesn't get asked, you are free to email it to me and I will respond. Uh, and um, if you have input or comments you wanna to share to me that don't get shared, again, feel free to e email those to me. I commit to read every single email that I get uh, connected to uh, COVID-19. All right, uh, uh, Jessica, Andrea, let's start with a poll um, of who is on the call. So you guys know how to do this. Click this off. We'll give you about 15 seconds. Uh, we've got 656 people on the call, 665 and going up. So just take, uh, take a few seconds and let us know who's on the call. All right, let's show the results there. Good, 366 staff members, 188 faculty members, 33 administrators, couple of students, three parents, and six others. So again, thank you for uh, joining us today. I suspect we'll have other people join us as, uh, as we get started. So um, I, uh, my job to talk about uh, uh, last year, 2021 was certainly, a challenging year on so many different levels. And yet, uh, in many ways, we were very successful. Uh, we spent a lot of time, and one of the things we think we did well was manage our pandemic response. Uh, we had a plan. We had a plan from the beginning, uh, and we stuck to it. We thought it was important uh, to have in-person classes. We thought it was important that our residence halls and our rec center and our PSU were open. We thought it was important that, uh, that we create a meaningful student experience, and we thought we could do that safely. Um, and our principles were uh, that we believe that what we do as a university is really important as important that grocery stores are open or that uh, hospitals are open or the police station is open or, or anything else. What we do is important. And we knew that because of the makeup of our students, so many Pell eligible students, so many first generation students, that if we did not uh, have a meaningful on-campus experience, many of our students would not come. Uh, they, they would not be able to access uh, just online classes, if, even, and even if they could, they would have other responsibilities if they were home, like work or childcare, et cetera. And so 
Um, that is particularly true of our students of color and first generation students. We thought it was important to be open and we thought we could do it safely. And so uh, obviously you see on, the, on this slide, some of the things that we did differently last year to do that. If we go to the next slide, uh, really important that we created a fabulous COVID-19 hotline and response team. Um, and by second semester, we were rolling out the vaccine. 11,000 doses given at majors today, plus another 6,200 given over two days at our mega uh, event uh, uh, on campus. Our numbers show uh, that we were able to do this. After the, that spike, those first uh, three to four weeks of campus, first semester stabilized. And then in second semester, even though cases in January and February in Greene County were the highest they have been since the pandemic began, higher than they are now, uh, we were able to manage through that semester with very, uh, very few cases uh, on campus. And the result of that, uh, one of the ways we know the plan worked is that our enrollment held. Um, last year, there were 600,000 fewer students in college in the United States, and our enrollment held. Um, we look at the next slide. That's the major reason we didn't have to lay anyone off. Uh, you know, you all will remember these, these virtual meetings. We were talking about pay cuts and, and uh, elimination of jobs. And none of that had to happen. And, and we were able to, to make uh, testing available to everyone, make, make access to the vaccine available, the provost office and the faculty center for teaching and learning. And, and uh, along with help from our academic uh, leadership team, we're able to, to deliver classes and, and we provided support to our students. We surveyed them three times. One of the questions uh, was, do you need to talk to someone? And, and we called hundreds of students to have one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, to support them getting through the semester. Um, and so uh, one of our success stories last year, bes besides managing through the pandemic, was our enrollment. You'll see that we have been for five years in a row above 24,000 students on the Springfield campus, above 26,000 students as a system. Uh, and um, particularly what did well on the graduate enrollment side the next slide shows graduate enrollment at an all-time record high. We will surpass that, uh, that magic 4,000 number this fall because of all of the good work that's going on there. Um, we had real conversations about in a pandemic, should we continue our strategic planning? We were halfway through the SIM plan and we were about to begin the long range plan, the master plan, the visioning guide, our board encouraged us to move forward. We thought we could, and we were able to complete uh, all of that planning work during um, the uh, uh, semester, and the as well as the action plan for this year. If uh, you read Inside Missouri State this week, uh, the targets that our board has set for us in the long range plan and specific items for, for the action plan for this year are included. We had a really good year in Jefferson City. Uh, Three and a half million dollar core appropriation increase and funding for a variety of projects. That success has allowed us to do the largest across the board compensation increase uh, in the 10 years that I've been here and significantly um, uh, improve our dental plan, which will start in January. So if you need dental work, wait till January, if at all you can, because if uh, the plan now pays for much, much more than the current one does. On the federal side uh, of government relations, uh, we have a great chance to get uh, significant funding for the Grand Street underpass uh, renovation through our work with, Senator, with Congressman Long 
Uh, and we've been working with Senator Blunt's office for a major uh, renovation and expansion funding uh, for Temple Hall. In fact, Senator Blunt's team was on campus this week uh, and we seem to be on track for that. Uh, we need a budget, a federal budget bills to be passed this year. And so look for that to happen in the next several months. One of the things that we needed to do was restructure our tuition. Uh, in a pandemic, it made less and less sense to charge different rates for different modalities of classes. Uh, and so we were able to restructure that so that all of our classes, whether they're seated, blended, or or uh, online, we now charge the same rate uh, for those. And that was broadly supported by all stakeholders, including students, and was approved by the Commissioner of Higher Education. You know, the most important thing we do is uh, uh, um, help young professionals complete their credential and get started in their careers. And for the third year in a row, we had over 5,000 degrees awarded uh, and we awarded the most credentials in our history, 5,844 over the last year. We had many other academic successes, none more important than the four-year look-in by the Higher Learning Commission uh, to review our accreditation. We got tremendously good comments. I want to thank Carrie Franklin for the tremendous work she did leading uh, this important uh, accreditation review for the university. On the next slide, um, one of the things I wanted to highlight was the $4 million five-year grant for a coders project. That's a great partnership where we're working to promote computer science, writing, physics, and math instructions in grades three through eight. Again, Carrie Franklin led that work. Maybe the most important work we're doing for the future of the university and its profile is increasing our doctoral, professional doctoral programs. We've got our third doctoral program across the finish line. We're waiting for state approval now. We also got our second terminal degree, uh, Master in Fine Arts in Dramatic Writing. And we're working on at least three other professional doctorates now. This really is the future of the university and it's critical uh, for our region and our state that we are able to turn out this level of professional. I wanna commend Frank for his vision and his work along with our academic administra administration for working on these important, important programs. That's a big piece of the long range plan for the next five years. We've had success uh, in the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion front. The Multicultural Resource Center, brand new, will open on Monday next week, first week of classes. If you haven't seen that, right across from Starbucks and the Student Union, take a look. Um, Saab, Student African American Brotherhood, relocated to Springfield last summer. Their first year on campus was tremendously successful. They are making a real difference in the lives of many men of color on campus and in the high schools, and those programs will continue to respond. On the next slide, it really highlights uh, the Bear Bridge program. And again, I want to uh, give a shout out to Judith Martinez, who has spearheaded this work. Um, tremendously successful. You know, in the last five years or so, we've been successful in hiring faculty of color. We have been substantially less successful in keeping faculty of color. And so uh, creating a meaningful mentorship program to help first and second year faculty navigate the tenure process, get connected on campus, answer questions, learn how to be a new faculty member at a predominantly white university. All but one of the folks came back uh, for their second or third year. Um, and that in the long term is gonna make a tremendous difference for both our students uh, as well as the faculty, as our faculty. Uh, we took our whole leadership team through the Facing Racism training. Uh, Wes Pratt and his team, Lyle Foster, do it. Leslie Anderson do a tremendous job at that. Many of our board members went through, our whole administrative leadership team went through, our academic leadership team went through. I think everyone at West Plains has gone through. It's the first time I had gone through it, 
And, and I think I know a lot about DEI, uh, um, and, and yet there were there were significant eye-opening uh, interactions and comments and information. And so uh, I want to thank uh, Wes and his team uh, for leading us through that. On the uh, uh, on the downtown site, uh, the E factory is, uh, expansion is completed and full. Mechanical engineering space is is state of the art and uh, and and finished as well. Uh, the uh, uh, Jordan Valley Innovation Center, also called the Blunt Center, uh, is under construction now. We've got funding for the Missouri Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And really, um, we have, uh, by working with the city, um, we were instrumental in creating the plans that are going to result in the daylighting of Jordan Creek and the rebirth, not only of the Idea Commons area, but for, for, but for all of downtown. And I think that is one of the most transformative uh, pro projects uh, that the university has ever been a part of. Construction supposed to begin next fall, a year from now. Uh, a couple of other facility projects completed, the addition to the Macquarie Family Health Sciences Hall, as well as the new event center at Greenwood. And then we've got a couple of projects uh, under construction now. Uh, the jo John Goodman Amphitheater, which will be done by the 60th season of Tent Theater next summer, as we work to make the Reynolds College of Arts and Letters a destination arts campus, as well as the SBS Magnet School that's under construction at DAR. Now, no university money is going into the Magnet School construction. I know people have asked me, well, why in the world do we care about this? Why, why do we care if, if Springfield Public Schools has a Magnet School, um, an, a an agricultural Magnet School on our property? Well, one, it's helping to create that pipeline uh, of students that are likely to study there in, in, in time. But I also knew that we could leverage that private money with money from the state and that came through. We got $4 million to help us build a new facility for the University at Dar Agriculture Center that never would have come to us, but for the uh, private money that is going into the magnet school. So again, part of a plan uh, that we saw come to fruition this year. Lots of work on the infrastructure. If you have questions about that, Jeff Coiner is on our panel today and uh, can, can respond to things as we work to improve cybersecurity uh, and, and a variety of other things. Uh, a huge highlight this year, everybody look at these numbers, guys. $62 million of external funding this year. Eight years ago, in my third year as president, we were at 36 million. We have almost doubled that, setting records with private giving through the foundation, more than three million more than we've ever gotten before, setting records on grants. And, and we pull the COVID money out of here. This, this is not inflated with all of the COVID money that came through. That is $36 million of external funding, primarily for research that, that you all um, uh, applied for and received. And so well done. Again, this changes the profile of the university. On the private gift side, as we look at this, uh, first time we'd ever been over $25 million, first time our endowment's ever been valued at over $100 million, and we're less than $20 million away from raising a quarter billion dollars in the onward upward campaign. If you think about some of the notable gifts uh, that came through, the John Goodman's gift for the amphitheater and Cam Peters' lead gift for, um, for the work that's starting this week at the professional building, the naming of, uh, of the Reynolds College of Arts and Letters with the biggest scholarship gift in the history of the university. I want to give Brent Dunn and his team a great shout out for the work they did. But, but the academic leadership works on these gifts as well. Mark Smith, Sean Wall, uh, Tammy Yaki is working with the Blunt Group on the funding there. Doesn't happen without great partnership from the academic side. And so really good work there. Stay, stay on this slide for a minute here, uh, Jessica, if you can, before I flip it over to David. Um, so, so let me just sum up this part by saying, folks, we had a tremendous year. 
Um, and we did all of this during the pandemic. Wow. So thank you for really good work. It happens because we all care about what we do. We all know that what we do is meaningful. We want to create a great university for our students, uh, for the research, for our, our state and our nation. And you all went above and beyond all year to help us have one of the best years in the history of the university, despite the fact that we're in a pandemic. So that's my transition. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to David Hall and he's gonna take you through uh, about 10 minutes of a COVID-19 update. I'll come back with some comments and then we'll open it up for questions. David, all yours. All right, thank you. On this uh, first slide that we'll have coming up here, uh, provides our cases by week. So this began at January 1st. You can see those first couple big spikes. And as part of those big spikes, that was our return to campus testing. So that was something we were very fortunate we were able to do uh, back in January. And we think that had an impact on being able to keep our numbers down throughout the rest of the um, semester and then also through the summer. You can see in July, uh, that's whenever uh, we started seeing an increase due to the Delta variant. And now we have less students certainly on campus, but we still saw a slight increase in that. Uh, we're doing our return to campus actually right now as uh, students are moving in. So I would expect these numbers to go up uh, because we are catching many of those students as they're starting to come back onto campus. On the next slide, you see that uh, the positivity rate. So we really focus on two primary factors. One is our cases, and the second thing is positivity rate. And so uh, on this, you can see the positivity rate to where that it started increasing uh, back in May. Our first identified cases of uh, a Delta variant were identified in the week of May 16th. And you can see how quickly uh, that impacted the campus and uh, the percent of positives. Certainly we were not doing as much testing. Uh, this is uh, uh, the testing that was done at majors. So as individuals that were symptomatic were coming in and being tested. So you could see a, a large spike of that at the first part of July, and then has continued to trend down. It's actually it was below 5% last week. And uh, which is, is really lower than what I would expect. It's lower than what our community is. And uh, so I think that's some, actually some pretty good numbers. We'll see what it does over the next week or two. On this slide, this is for the um, Springfield Green County numbers. And so if you look back in January and the number of cases that we had, and then you see our spike in the number of cases that we've got in July, uh, we didn't peak as high as what we did back in January. Now, we received a lot of national attention whenever uh, we were seeing this peak in July. And the reason is, is because other um, areas, uh, we, we were one of the early ones to get the Delta variant. And so uh, it made national news because we were seeing lots of cases when others weren't. Uh, but frankly, as we were as high as what we were back in January, we've seen uh, it peaked on July the 20th and our seven day rolling case average has continued to drop uh, since that time. We would expect to see a bump in this as all of schools get back K-12 as well as higher ed get back in the community. We would expect to see this go up some and then it's continued to track down. State of Missouri has uh, plateaued already. Uh, so we'll see if there's goes ahead and starts continuing a downward tra trajectory or uh, whether they, uh, you know, kind of what impact that is. Uh, we're, we're right now, we're lower rates than what it is in Kansas City and about on par what they are in uh, both uh, uh, Boone County as well as in the St. Louis area. So the positivity rate, I mentioned the, you know, those, that last one with our uh, seven day rolling average of cases and then the positivity rate. So this is for the county. And I think this is a really important slide for us to be looking at. We know the CDC as it uh, sets those high risk areas. It looks at those that are above 10% in their positivity rate. Right now, Greene County is at about 11%, uh, but it is on the decline. So, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be down below that 10% or even better below that 8%. And then ultimately, as we want to get down below that 5% um, in the positivity rate, it's a, it's a real good indicator for us of seeing is how many are out there that are, that are positive. This slide is for hospitalizations. 
So there is some um, debate as to whether the Delta variant is more um, um, uh, causes greater severity of illness, um, that's still um, to be determined by some of the, the cases that are out there. But whenever I look at it from Southwest Missouri, you can see where we were back in January. If you'll remember, we had more cases in January than what we did in July. And yet what we saw is hospitalizations were actually lower in January than what they were in July. So uh, we did peak out on that. We've been seeing that go down um, gradually. I, I will say as if you look at the number of cases that are strictly from Greene County that are hospitalized, it's dropped off significantly since uh, uh, the end of July. This will continue to remain high and could for several months actually, because uh, our hospitals here in Greene County are taking patients from uh, not all, only all over the state of Missouri, but also uh, Northwest Arkansas and even from some of the Southern states that they're sending those up here. So that number probably will not decline significantly for quite some time. And then of course, here's the, the percent that are vaccinated. So you can see where that we had a real good ramp up as we got vaccine availability back in uh, March and April and into May as we had those high demands. And then, uh, you know, we had an adjustment at the beginning of June to where that they made that available from age 12 and over instead of just over age 16 and over. Um, there has been an increase, a market increase uh, over the last, since the mid July uh, on the vaccinations that are given per week. Right now they're running about 4,800 per week that they're given. So that's been an increasing rate uh, where it had kind of leveled off on that. Uh, hopefully that will continue, although it has kind of flattened out on uh, the number of new people that are getting vaccinated. And, and you know, certainly we'll have more discussion about uh, uh, the third dose of the vaccination and what that means. So kind of the last slide that I've got is uh, a lot of questions we always get is, well, you know, what percent of our employees are vaccinated? And as you can see, faculty at 79.07. Uh, so if you look at that 80%, uh, frankly, that's better than our hospital systems. And, uh, I, you know, better than Mercy, I think that's, uh, that says a lot for, uh, I mean, our, even the 75% are total employees. Uh, I, I think that says a lot uh, for the, the uh, um, our employees that we have and how that we've, we've really educated them and we've made it very readily available for them to have access to it. Our staff, I was very pleased with this at uh, nearly 75%. And, and not surprisingly, it's lower at West Plains. Uh, obviously, we'd like to see that higher, uh, but that's indicative of the different areas that we live in. And certainly all of ours are significantly higher than our surrounding community. Uh, also, to give you an idea within, uh, you know, we're doing... Uh, uh, move in right now. And uh, I, I just got a report of those that are moving in as of right now. This was updated just a little bit ago. 48.7% of our students that are living on campus have been vaccinated. And uh, that is really, really good whenever you consider that, uh, um, that most in that age group, it's in the low 20% that have been vaccinated in that. So uh, overall, we're, we're very pleased with that and continue to see about making good progress on it. So, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to President Smart and then let him go from there on his comments regarding the COVID. Thank you, David. I want to uh, build for a minute on, uh, on David's comments and some of the data that you've seen. I, I know we have some people that are anxious and nervous about, about students coming back, um, but, but I want to emphasize, and, and the reason we, we went through some of the data for the last year is I really feel we can do this. Uh, why? Uh, let me start with this. Conditions are better today than they were last semester or uh, uh, than they were this summer. Um, and so um, daily cases, the seven-day average were 114 today. In July, that seven-day average was 240. In January of this year, it was 255. That was the peak. So we're less than half of where we were in January when we were operating. Uh, we do have 212 people in the Greene County hospitals. 
As David said, most are from outside Greene County. We have only 75 people from Greene County, down from 134 in July. Our seven day case rate per 100,000, that's a metric. That's the C, one of the two CDC metrics they look at. Are you in a substantial or high area of transmission? That's still too high. We need to get down to 100 or below. Uh, but right now we're at 265. In January of this year, the number was 608. And in the middle of July, when this wave peaked, we were at 565. So we are down 300 cases uh, by that metric. Our positivity rate is 11% down from 15. The state is significantly higher now. Again, we wanna be below 10 and then below eight and then below five. Those are the two critical metrics that our team is following every day in making that determination of do we wear masks and what other uh, safety uh, um, procedures do we need to adjust. Second, we have more tools today than we had in January. Most importantly, the vaccine. You know, uh, in January, when we were doing all the things that we're planning to do this fall, we were doing it without the vaccine. Now we have the vaccine, we have better testing, we have systematic wastewater testing, we have better quality masks for everyone to use. And so we have better tools to make it through this semester than we had all of last year. And then frankly, we, ha we have more knowledge. There's been a lot more scientific knowledge and testing done about the vaccines, about the virus that we can use uh, to our advantage. Uh, Jessica, put my last uh, next to last slide up here and we'll share that with everyone. Um, this is the, um, oh, th these were uh, mitigation. Let's go one more. This was a slide that was shared during the uh, um, uh, Mercy Board meeting yesterday. And, and, and the reality of this is um, through the science that we've been working with since the vaccine rolled out in January, we know that the vaccine works. If you look at this slide, weekly COVID-19 incidents per 100,000. So per 100,000, if you're not vaccinated, well, 178 of you are gonna get COVID. Uh, it goes down to 21 if you're vaccinated, an eight-fold reduction. Uh, in terms of hospitalization incidents, it's a 25-fold reduction, a tenth of one person per 100,000. If you go down to death, if you are vaccinated, uh, 0.04, compared to one out of a uh, 100,000 people that will die. Again, a 25-fold reduction. Will Sistrunk, who's the leading infectious disease expert at Mercy, said this is the best vaccine in the history of the world. It really works. It makes it much less likely you're gonna contract the disease. But if you do, and you still can, and we know our, some of our own people that have been vaccinated have, it with almost certainty keeps you out of the hospital and prevents you from dying. And that's what a vaccine is supposed to do. And so, uh, as David said, uh, our, our rate of 76% uh, is higher than, than the employee base at either hospital. And so you guys understand the importance of getting vaccinated, but, so that, that rate of 79% for vaccinated Springfield faculty, that means we have 162 full-time faculty members who are as of yet unvaccinated. And that rate of 74.83% for our Springfield staff means we have 303 full-time staff members that are still unvaccinated. And so I just wanna to talk to that group of 465 people, and I hope you're on this call, um, because by not being vaccinated, you are taking a risk of becoming seriously ill or dying. Uh, Ryan DeBoof is my chief of staff, as you know. Last week, he went to his RA's funeral. 
45 year old man, sole breadwinner for his family, four children, four children who are now going to live without a father and whose mother who, who and their mother who hasn't worked in 20 years is going to have to figure out how to support them because he didn't believe in vaccines. We've had a 20 year old, 23 year old woman die at, at, at one of our hospitals. We've had a 30 year old man die at one of our hospitals in Greene County in the last month. I get emotional thinking about this and talking about this because the worst day of the last year was when Jason Ray, a 51 year old employee at the university died. Wasn't anybody's fault, wasn't his fault, wasn't anybody's fault. We didn't have the vaccine then. Unfortunately, he contracted it off campus and he didn't survive. But now we have the vaccine. I don't want the next death to be you because it is avoidable. You know, I've heard people say, well, I'm worried, I wanna have children. I'm expecting a baby. Guys, it would be worse to be dead. It's just that simple. It would be worse to be dead. Well, I'm, be I'm breastfeeding my child. I'm worried about that. The science is it's a positive, not a negative. And it is worse for somebody else to raise your child if you are dead. That's what we're talking about. We are making life or death decisions. Please, please think about it. Pray about it. Talk to your doctor about it. Please make the decision to get vaccinated for yourself, for your family, for your coworkers, for your friends. It's really, really important. And it's also important if you haven't done so to upload your vaccination status because it, 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 it's gonna help us all feel better if 85 or 90% of our coworkers are vaccinated and we all know that. Go to the My Health portal if you haven't done so, upload your vaccine card so that we can know you're vaccinated. All right, enough of that. We wanna reward the people that are doing the right thing. And so we're going to, we've already drawn, $5,000 winners from our employees who, uh, who have uh, been vaccinated. We will draw 15 more over the next several weeks. So again, still time to participate. If you haven't gotten vaccinated, go get that first shot, get in the drawing. If you've been vaccinated anywhere but majors, go to the My Health portal and send in your information. So here are our winners. It is a broad group of folks. Here we go. First, oh, let me say two of them are from athletics. Athletics is vaccinated at about a 92% rate. So, you know, uh, it pays off. Uh, first winner, Kristen Doty, part-time employee for women's softball. Congratulations, Kristen. Second winner, our head women's basketball coach, Coach Mox. Coach, congratulations. You know, Coach Mox is just a winner. She wins at everything, apparently, including drawings. Next winner is a per course faculty member in kinesiology. Congratulations, Sarah Powell. Next winner, an administrative assistant at Ozarks Public Television, Margaret Osler. Margaret, congratulations. Finally, our last winner today, uh, the executive assistant at the Roy Blunt Jordan Valley Innovation Center, uh, Shelly Deckard. Shelly, congratulations. Thanks for the example you have all set. Uh, and uh, uh, more winners to come next week. We'll be drawing every week for the next five weeks to give additional $1,000 prizes uh, out. All right, let's stop there. And we will open it up for questions. We've got 50 minutes and we'll stay uh, up until five o'clock to answer questions if we have that many questions. So with that, let's, uh, 
Let's bring our panel back on. And if you're on the panel, if you turn your uh, screens on. All right, Suzanne, you got the first question. I do, uh, and it's just kind of level set for everyone. Can you define positivity rate, please, just one more time, since we throw that around a lot? David, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, that's the total number of tests that they gave, um, the total number of positives divided by the total number of tests that were given. Um, so, um, you know, if you had 100 tests and 13 of those were positive, you'd had a 13% positivity rate. Uh, I, I know there was uh, a discussion about testing and uh, testing levels are as high right now in the county as what they were back in January and February as well. So we have a large number of tests that are being given um, both here on campus through majors as well as through the county and um, through the um, you know various outlets within the county. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to start off uh, with the vaccine questions since this has been what we've been focused on and it has been upvoted quite a bit so it's very popular. Multiple vaccines are already a bit required for students by public universities as well as public schools and hundreds of colleges, including most of the world's leading universities, are now requiring COVID-19 vaccinations for students. With over 26,000 students attending Missouri State in a given semester, it is easy to see the positive impact this could have in the community and could prevent hospitalizations and deaths. Has the possibility of mandating COVID-19 vaccines for students been considered? Yes, um, it, it's been considered and it's been talked about, but it's currently uh, not on the table. Um, no public two or four year universities in Missouri are mandating vaccine. Uh, I, I, it would have significant unintended consequences, I think, if we went down uh, that road. For example, uh, we know it would significantly reduce our enrollment. And so for every thousand students we lost because of a, a vaccine mandate, that would cost us $10 million. Um, our best estimate is we would lose five to 6,000 students if we went down a vaccine mandate. That's 50 to $60 million. That's hundreds of people being laid off and losing their jobs. Um, and so it, it, is, it is currently not uh, viable. It, it Frankly, it is, um, uh, if we did that, um, uh, besides that kind of impact, we would get a significant uh, negative government response. Uh, I, I expect that we, um, um, we would be directed or prohibited from doing same uh, moving forward. And so we would have lost the students without gaining uh, the uh, advance of that. Uh, the logistics of that are very challenging given the uh, ability, the easy ability to get fake vaccine uh, cards and documentation. Um, what, what do I do with the 465 employees? That, uh, uh, that haven't been vaccinated. Uh, many of them would still not be vaccinated. What, what you know, we, we would expect to have 50 to 100 uh, tenured faculty members that refuse to get vaccinated. What we do, how, how do we manage that? It, it's just not a viable option currently. Um, David, anything you would add to that? No, I, I really don't think so. And certainly, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about that. And um, but it just it, it just as of right now, our, our whole strategy has been that we want to incentivize it and encourage it and not mandate that. Uh, I will say is I get a lot of negative feedback, a significant amount of negative seat, uh, feedback um, saying that. Uh, you know, why are we even bribing students to get vaccinated by offering an incentive? So I can't imagine the response if we were trying to mandate a vaccine. 
it's just not a viable strategy in Missouri or Arkansas or Iowa or Kansas, anywhere in the, in the, in the old Confederate states, uh, anywhere in, uh, in any of the Midwest or Western states. It's simply, it's simply not a viable option for us. Okay, thank you. Um, just to, and, and David, I know you noted this earlier, but if we can kind of bring it out again, does, uh, can you repeat the current data we have on the fraction of students that have been vaccinated? And same for the university employees? Yeah, so let me, uh, just a second. So on our university employees, uh, we're at, uh, uh, our average is uh, 75.12. Again, that is a really, uh, a very positive number for that. Uh, regarding those that are, uh, you know, we, we, we collect numbers on the percentage of students that are vaccinated, uh, but many of those are just getting on campus. And so as we're visiting with them, they've not submitted their information to majors yet to be entered into some of those drawings. Um, but the ones for moving in with residence halls, um, they have a real incentive because because if not, they get tested when they get here on campus. 48.7% of those students living in our residence halls have submitted documentation that they're vaccinated. I expect that will continue to go up as move-in continues as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, our next one, uh, again, kind of a student some vaccinations. Emergency medical care at hospitals in Springfield is tenuous right now. Have you notified parents and students that when students need emergency medical care, even for non-COVID reasons, they are at risk for not being able to receive that care? What are we doing to inform students of this and urge them to exercise even more caution? And my question just disappeared. Okay. <laughs> uh, sorry. Team, if we can wait till I'm done with the questions before deleting. Thanks. Um, let's see. Sorry, uh, let me see if I can get it here. Well, I think we got a, I think we got enough of it yeah. we can, that we can uh, handle a piece of it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, again, I, I'm on the Mercy Board. Uh, we have great connections with our local hospitals. We are confident that any student who had to be hospitalized in Springfield would get the appropriate care. The numbers are going down, not up in our county. And so uh, um, we had no students. We, we, we had 1,600 students who contracted the virus last year. Not a single one had to be hospitalized. Uh, and, and so again, we are confident. Um, we have the relationships with the providers in town. We are confident that anyone who needed hospitalization could get it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this summer, I was told I was told vaccinated staff and faculty could not get asymptomatic testing. Considering our student vaccination rate and breakthrough infection infections data, can faculty and staff get asymptomatic testing in the fall to ensure our families are staying safe? Dr. Maggie, are you on? I am. Uh, video won't turn on, but audio works. Uh, we're largely charged with doing symptomatic testing at majors. The CRL speed of testing comes out of the security office, director hall. I don't think that your office has ever denied asymptomatic testing, have they, sir? Yeah, I might clarify that he is. Early on, whenever the CDC came out and said that they did not recommend testing for asymptomatic that had been vaccinated, we did uh, stop doing that. But as the Delta variant came in and we started seeing the breakthrough cases, we have reinstituted where that is, regardless whether you're uh, vaccinated or not, we provide that testing. So does that mean anyone can get tested at, at majors that wants to be? Yeah, we'll test anybody who's symptomatic. And of course, some people come in who need screening, like we're doing the international population as they arrive with international travel. So we do a broad away, largely symptomatic, but also some asymptomatic. And I think primarily the ones through the speed of on campus with security are generally uh, population screening and asymptomatic type screening, aren't they, Director Hall? Yeah, that's right. Well, so last, if you'll remember back in both the fall as well as the spring, uh, we, we would be setting up tables in Plaster Student Union as well as over in um, 
the library. We'll be doing that again this semester. So that'll be starting up. We've hired the, the uh, workers to be able to do that. So anybody can stop by and get tested, whether faculty, staff, student, and it is no cost. Uh, and it's designed as asymptomatic testing. So if you don't have symptoms, uh, but you're concerned, you can stop by there and get that done. We're also doing a lot of asymptomatic testing with special high risk groups. So whenever we think about um, uh, the, you know, well, the bear crew testing is they were moving in, we were doing uh, asymptomatic testing for them. Um, the, uh, the RAs as they were moving in and, uh, uh, you know, uh, like the corral and as well as other groups. So we are doing a lot of asymptomatic testing, but it it's available for anyone. Even now, you know, we have it where they can stop by the parking office and pick up one of those kits. Okay, thank you. Uh, another popular question, how will Missouri State handle a campus shutdown as a result of COVID when necessary? I, I don't imagine that we are going to have to close campus. I, I just don't foresee that given, given the, 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 the tools that we currently have now. Uh, and, and so I expect uh, I expect classes to continue. I expect events to continue. We, we have significant testing capability. We have significant ability to quarantine or isolate uh, students. Uh, we have the ability uh, to continue classes um, remotely for a short period of time and, and uh, as necessary. Uh, we believe, just like we did last year, we believe we can manage through this because we have more tools and more skill and more knowledge now than we had last year in November, December, January, February, when the peak was higher than it is now. And so I, I don't foresee any scenario in which the university uh, has to close down, go online. Our plan is co to continue on and manage through this. We, we believe we have the people and the ability and the knowledge and the experience to do that. Okay, thank you. The COVID dashboard that was displayed on the university website from spring 2020 through spring 2021 was very helpful. Might we be reinstituting that again for this fall semester? It starts on Monday and we will have added uh, vaccination rates for uh, students and employees and residential students. So even more information available because that's important for everybody to see. Uh, the vaccination rates will be updated weekly. The other material continues to be updated, updated every day. Great, thank you. When, uh, when will the third vaccine be available for faculty and staff and will it start with individuals over 65 or will it be open to everyone? Dr. Maggie, you want to take that one? Uh, yes, President. Uh, it actually started yesterday. Uh, yesterday, We did seven third dose uh, Pfizer vaccinations yesterday for people who indicated that they met the current CDC guidance requirements. Uh, with an emergency use authorization vaccine, we're obligated legally to follow the CDC guidance on its use. And we have that on our website. If you're interested in seeing it, go to the majors. Uh, Web page, home page, and you'll see in the COVID section that we have there a delineation. Basically, it's people who are actively fighting cancer, or basically, it's people who have primary or severe immunodeficiency syndromes, or it's some individuals who have an unchecked medical condition like advanced stage HIV or certain medications like very high dose steroids or immune suppressing medicines. And if you have those things, and the CDC estimates that's currently less than 3% of the population, then you're eligible for the third dose, assuming you've had the first two, and uh, just sign up, and we're glad to give it to you. It did start that yesterday. Today, uh, in case you haven't been glued to the news on this, FTA did announce that on September 20th, they're going to expand it to a broader population. The broader population will be defined as people who are eight months out from their second vaccination, a messenger RNA, it does not apply to Johnson yet. It's just the Moderna or the Pfizer. By virtue of the rank order that people had last winter, you recall that the additional groups were nursing home residents, healthcare workers, and then the elderly. So we're expecting that the eight month people probably on September 20th and shortly thereafter will be those uh, categories of people. 
but there will be much more news to follow to kind of infill on that. So yes, we're currently doing it for CDC-directed people, which is moderately severely immunodeficient. And within about a month, it'll be opened up to broader categories of people who had theirs eight months ago. And we believe we will have sufficient supply to cover everyone, correct, Dave? Yes, sir. We have 650 Pfizer doses in our possession now and in the ultra Pro freezer at uh, JVIC. Uh, there's not any difficulty getting Pfizer. I will be frank and say that we cannot get Johnson. Johnson's had manufacturing problems with uh, leaser companies that they engaged in Philadelphia. And so there's back order nationally on Johnson. But Pfizer seems to be uh, without limit. Uh, the federal government assures us that they've been uh, building up a big uh, supply of Pfizer so that they can both meet this new expanded challenge and still meet their ethical obligations to share vaccine around the world for vaccine equity. They think they can do both and they plan for it, they indicate. Good. So again, I would encourage everyone uh, to follow that eight month time frame from when you got your, is it when you got your first shot or your second shot, Dave? Second, second one. Uh, when you finish your second one and then at eight months, that's when you're, you're eligible, sir. So we will, we will have that at majors and we will uh, encourage everyone on on that same schedule uh, to get that third dose so that, uh, so that we all get through this um, as safely as we can. Suzanne? Okay, thank you. Um, this is related to vaccine mandates, but a little bit different. Uh, will Missouri State be mandating vaccinations for its staff, vaccination, sorry, for its staff at the Missouri State University Child Development Center, the CDC, uh, faculty and staff with children frequently use the CDC and these children are too young to be vaccinated? So, so right now, uh, particularly with the vaccine still not uh, having full approval, we don't plan to mandate that anyone get the vaccine. Uh, I, I think we're going to have to see how this plays out over time. Uh, and, and, you know, nothing is ever off the table. But, but for right now, uh, there's not any plan to mandate anyone get the vaccine. You know, as we think about, I've got I've got a hundred and let me look back at the number here. Hold on. I've got 162 full-time faculty members who are unvaccinated. Um, you know, if you think about what, what does it mean to mandate vaccine to that group? Let's say half of them don't get it. I mean, are, are we advocating that we terminate 80 tenured faculty member from our campus? Uh, that doesn't seem to me to be the way that we should go. I, I think over time, you'll see our rates go up significantly, and both on the student, the staff, and the employee side. I think more and more, you know, as you have to have a vaccine to fly, to go to a concert, to eat in a restaurant, uh, I think more and more people, as we see that it is safe, will get vaccinated. For example, uh, the Missouri Valley Conference and the Missouri Valley Football Conference have essentially said if teams can't play because they have players in quarantine or isolation, then you forfeit a game. Well, that's going to be quite an incentive for our, for our student athletes to get vaccinated. There are going to be more and more things like that that we all face. That just living your life, that the way you want to live if you're not vaccinated is gonna be more and more challenging. Again, let me just encourage you, get it now, get it now. So that you don't have to figure out how you're gonna work around all of those obstacles and keep yourself safe, your children safe, your family safe. Please get vaccinated. President Smart, I might add in on that is overwhelmingly, uh, our workers at Child Development Center are vaccinated and uh, we are testing those who are not. Uh, so we're going through regular weekly testing because of exactly that is that we know currently the vaccine is not available for that age group. Uh, although we, you know, certainly the indications we're hearing is that will uh, likely occur later on this year. And I believe we have purchased for campus uh, faculty and staff the N95 mask. We have, and so everyone uh, that would like to wear an N95 mask can. David Hall, do you want to talk about the effectiveness of that? That is, 
that is different, a different level of protection than the uh, cloth mask that we wore last year. Yeah, certainly uh, they are even a much higher level than what a um, what a surgical mask is. It's a, technically considered a respirator, and the, we've got the N95, KN95. It's just the uh, difference of who's the certifi certifying uh, agency on that or organization on it. Uh, we have uh, secured a, a large number of the N95s. Last year, that wasn't available because we were reserving those for our healthcare workers because this is what they wear when they are dealing with COVID patients because that's what protects them. Uh, very high level level of protection. It's fascinating how they work. Whenever you look at it, it's multi-layer. And uh, really the way that it does that is it uses a, a static charge in order to pick up those minute particles as they pass through the mask. So that's the reason that they're highly affected. Um, some users will find that it's, it's a little more challenging being um, to be able to breathe through those. So, you know, they're not necessarily, you know, some, some people are not going to like those, but do understand is they give you extremely high levels of protection. This is what our healthcare workers are wearing whenever they're working with, um, with those that have um, uh, COVID or other uh, highly contagious diseases. So your department uh, all have these masks. You can get them to wear at work or when you're interacting with, with other folks. We, we have the ability to continue to refresh that stock. And so again, um, that's a great safety precaution that didn't exist last year on campus. Great, thank you. Next question, I'm a faculty member. I have three young children under 12 years of age. They were virtual last year, but are in person this year, in person school this year. While my husband and I are vaccinated, how should I handle classes if my children have to quarantine at home? Can I come onto campus or will I have to move my classes to Zoom for a few days? And what if my kids get COVID, how do I handle my classes? Frank, do you want to start on that one? And then we can see if others want to add. Um, if, if it's a, a family situation, obviously it's going to be on a case-by-case -case consideration. And uh, it's not going to be automatic that you can just change your classes if, if the person themselves is not sick. But each case is going to have to be looked at uh, as that situation allows and if it will be a movement of a class to a distance learning mode then it would be a temporary thing as opposed to a you know move it and that's finished for the semester. President Smart, I might add in there as well. Um, two other things kind of going with this. If they're part of the Springfield Public School District or our, our Greenwood Lab School, um, if, if they are in a classroom, uh, both of those um, schools are requiring everyone to be masked. And if everyone in a classroom is masked, then it does, if somebody is positive within the classroom and has had close contact, it does not require them to um, go into quarantine. So that's first of all is, now that's not necessarily true of some of the surrounding school districts. So you may have that, but any of those in the Springfield Public School District or in um, Greenwood will probably not find very many of their children having to quarantine and not be able to go to school be, because of that. Second thing is quarantine has certainly uh, been reduced. Whereas a year ago we were dealing with a 14-day quarantine. Uh, since then, that's been reduced down to 10 days, and you can actually test out of that uh, if you get if you test negative, you know, three to five days after uh, the last close contact. So what we're going to expect is, is that uh, a lot fewer people will be going into quarantine as far as the adults. Uh, so for example, if the child is positive, uh, and then you've got the, uh, the parent, if they've been fully vaccinated, then they would not be required to go into quarantine as well. So we think that's going to have a significant impact on reducing the numbers that are going into quarantine. Okay, thank you. And related to that, given that there will undoubtedly be employees that need to stay home with children who are exposed to COVID, has consideration been given to bringing back emergency leave until vaccines are available to all? At this point, we, uh, the determination is not to uh, add additional emergency leave time. Uh, we'll, we'll track that. And, and if we think uh, that that's needed because of conditions, then, then we can bring it back. But as of right now, the decision has been not to add additional leave. Okay, and I am uh, returning, uh-oh, wait a minute. 
Okay, I'm returning to a, a, the question that was asked earlier with regard to capacity at hospital for non-COVID illnesses. So um, an example was that a family member was in the ER for over 12 hours at the Mercy ER in Springfield following a stroke because the hospital is prioritizing COVID patients. Ethically, parents and students need to be aware of this. Students need to be told that when they have accidents, injuries, alcohol-related inc incidents, they may be on their own regarding emergency care. Okay. So That's are we- I, I don't take that- Well, the question. question is, are we going to share, you know, inform them that emergency care may not necessarily be available because uh, the resources are being used up by COVID patients. <clears throat> we, have a great part, we have a great partnership with Mercy. I'm confident we can get any student who needs emergency care, emergency care in an appropriate amount of time. President, I'd like to add, this is Dr. Maggie from Majors. Uh, there's kind of the implicit assumption in these two related questions that the grass is greener on the other side. And that was an assumption is not necessarily true. I was reading recently that the state of Alabama has negative ICU beds. So if the student, for example, is from Alabama, it wouldn't be any better for them at home. In fact, it probably is better here based on things the president said. The second thing is that wait time in the emergency room at Mercy is not strictly COVID related. Uh, I've had patients for years at wait time similar to that, I'm sad to say in a non-COVID era. So they're doing a wonderful job there. They're obviously burdened with COVID, but uh, that wait time may be similar at the home institutions as well. So it's not necessarily greener on the other side. It's tough everywhere in the country right now with bed supply and with uh, workforce capacity and healthcare workers. And that's yet another reason to please get your vaccine and wear your mask because these people are working until they drop. We need to give them a break. Yeah, the, the, as Dr. Maggie said, the answer here is to be vaccinated and it's uh, and so that you're not uh, taking up space in a hospital and they can serve everyone. And we're making progress on that in our community. Okay, um, the COVID-19 uh, COVID is going to be with us for quite some time. What is the position of the university on international travel for faculty and students for official functions if they are fully vaccinated? Frank? Our position uh, going into the fall is that we're allowing travel. Of course, it will depend on the destination and what they allow. It'll also depend on you know, what kind of quarantine requirements they might have when they get there. All of those things would have to be taken into consideration on the specifics of a travel arrangement. But our international travel fund, for example, has um, been open for applications for this fall. I would also say that, you know, we don't know for sure what the airlines are going to do and requirements on a day-to-day -day basis that could change. So all of those are risk factors. And yet uh, we're not right now uh, saying that we prohibit travel. Yeah, I, you know, for example, uh, we have a student group looking at a trip to Spain end of October, beginning of November. Um, it appears if things are stay the same as they are now, that that's a trip that's viable particularly if everyone is vaccinated that is that is in that traveling party. So so I the the, the question has as a as an assumption in it that I think is really important and, and that is the virus is going to be with us. You know as I listen to our healthcare leaders talk about this the virus is going to be with us for months probably years. And so a piece of this is we've got to figure out how we operate in it, how we carry on meaningful lives, how we continue to educate, how we continue to travel. Um, I'm planning a trip to Egypt in January, and I'm planning to go if, if, if I don't have to quarantine for four weeks upon, upon arrival in that country, right? That would, that would make it impossible. And, and so we're going to work through all these things, but international travel is back. Um, it's back for the university, just going to, as Frank said, going to have to work through each piece because 
doesn't make sense to go to China if you've got a quarantine for four weeks before you can actually get out and then do the work, the research, the teaching um, that you wanted to do. On the other hand, if you can go to Spain, if you're vaccinated and immediately begin your work, that's a whole different animal. Okay, thank you. Um, circling back on the N95 mask, uh, are they multi-use and how long should one mask last someone? David? And the, um, you know, they're really designed to be used as a single use, but, it, you know, the single use is because they're really designed to be in the healthcare and uh, uh, like asbestos removal and fields such as that. And so what we've been saying is, you know, you know, where we, we've got enough. If you want to replace them every week, there's certainly no problem with that. If you have concern, you know, we'll make sure that you've got the N95 to be able to use that. Um, you know, it really depends on how much it is that you wear. They're really designed as a single use, but um, last year, certainly even healthcare workers, they were using them on, on multiple uses part of that. So we've got them available. I mean, we've got, we've got 13, thousand of them and we've got the ability to access thousands more. I, okay, I think that uh, all deans uh, got for their faculty a supply of at least two each as a start out, but uh, there's more backup that uh, David Hall has that hasn't been distributed out yet. I think the point is primarily on the teaching side is if you have two hours of classroom that you're wearing it in a day, but then you're in your office and not wearing anything, that's a whole lot different than an eight hour day. And so there's some judgment there that's going to be involved with how much wear that is going on in any given day as to whether you use it for a week or three days or even longer than a week if you only had two classes in the week. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I spent the day in Scholastic Appeals and a couple of students mentioned that being sequestered in Kentwood was depressing and that the communication Wi-Fi was intermittent. Have these things been discussed at the administrative level? Well, let's see. Who Do we have, uh, uh, I guess, either Matt Morris or uh, Gary Stewart or Dr. Cisco? Any, anyone want to take that one? Well, I'll be happy to jump in. Um, I'm sure that any place someone is in quarantine is a bit depressing. Uh, I will say that Kentwood is a, a beautiful facility. Our staff in residence life, uh, I think, has done a good job working with students to provide a clean, safe uh, place for quarantining So, um, it, with three meals a day. So I, I think it's I think it's a fairly good facility. And during the normal years, students love living there. Now related to Wi-Fi, we do have Wi-Fi access over there. And if a student has a challenge with it, we'd be happy to work with them. I was gonna jump in on that, Dee. We, we upgraded that a couple of years within the last couple of years, but certainly would be happy to address any areas that, that maybe aren't covered well. I might also just add to that is that's the first I've heard about any issues with Wi-Fi over there, frankly, um, particularly at the beginning of the uh, of the year last year, we did um, heard several of those comments about concern about it. And, and here's why it can be somewhat depressing. Uh, you're a new student. You want to be out there with your friends. Instead, is you're in a room by yourself, and frankly, is you don't even have all your normal belongings that you would have if you lived there full time. So you know they'll bring their computer, and they'll bring you know that some of them will even bring a TV with them, and and things like that. But if you think about it, is you know you're really stuck there whenever you want to be outside playing, and uh, you just have the very very essentials that you tend to bring with you on that, and most of your stuff is back to that. So uh, I would agree. I think that's why we also see many of our students who choose to go home uh, at the you know, after the first few weeks of last year, I think, you know, students quickly realized is um, I'm a lot more comfortable quarantining at home away from my family in my own room than I am there. Great, thank you. Uh, heading back to masking topic, will university masking policies be mandated for regional campuses across the state, such as OTC sites where uh, Missouri State courses are held? 
So OTC has a uh, indoor mask mandate, just like we do. We work together to roll them out. They're very similar. Uh, every community college in Missouri, uh, except for maybe one up in the northern part of the state, has an indoor masking requirement. Every four-year public university in Missouri has an indoor masking requirement. We've all worked together to coordinate that so that the same rules apply wherever we are. Uh, Springfield Public Schools policy is very similar to ours as well. And so I, I, think, I think you'll find there's good overlap of consist, consistent policies. We're all working together to figure out when and if they come off uh, based upon the metrics that uh, David Hall and I talked about earlier. And so we have every two weeks, we, we interact with the other universities, the community colleges, the universities in our area so, to have a consistent policy uh, on this very topic. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, it, it, this goes back to the performance of the university over the past year. So the profile of the university has changed with the great increase in grant money. And as we all know, grad students are the ones who make this possible. However, our graduate students are still paid far less than what Missouri State considers its peer institutions. Is there a plan to increase stipends to be competitive with our peers and to provide a living wage to the backbone of our research program? Yeah, we'd like to pay them more. Uh, we did do an increase this year when we did an increase for everyone. Again, there's a limited amount of new funds and the executive budget committee that is composed of at least half the members or faculty members. We talk about where money gets allocated. Um, and so, um, Again, there's a limited fund and, you know, our employees are, are not paid uh, to where we would like them to be paid. We would like to hire additional people. There are lots of pulls on additional funding. Frank, you, you want to give a more detailed answer than that? Um, you know, we have two levels of pay. Uh, uh, increasingly, the graduate assistants uh, in most of the areas uh, have at least had their second year at the higher rate, but not all areas have followed that because they're limited on that amount of money, as uh, the president has said. Um, I, I think the data should be collected for the right kind of comparisons to be made. I haven't seen that data on a more recent, and it's not going to be comparable and we will not be there for a very long time to a research one institution. So we should follow the comparison and try to get as close as we can to our peer institutions, which are not in the research one category. Okay, thank you. Um, this one is a trickier uh, question only because I think the answer is going to be really hard. What advice uh, would you give if conversing with a colleague, student, or other staff, and they reveal they are against the vaccine? You know, um, well, you heard my spiel earlier on. I, I'm a true believer, and um, but 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 ultimately, we live in a free country. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, overall, it's way more good than bad, right? I mean, I'm, I am grateful every day that I'm not, I don't live in a country where someone um, controls every single thing I do and where I go, uh, but that I get to make those choices. I, I think what we, what we have to do is, is calmly and, um, uh, uh, with grace um, and, and with real concern, um, tell people our fears, be encouraging. Um, but, but ultimately, it's an individual decision. And um, uh, it's going to break my heart um, if someone I know that works at the university dies. It's going to break my heart for, their, for her children. Um, 
And I think you can share those kind of heartfelt um, emotions with people that you're close to. But, but ultimately, um, we, we all have to, you know, as adults, have to, have to make the decision that we think uh, is best. And uh, sometimes that decision is not going to be the same decision uh, that I would make. I, I would be encouraging. I would be a listener. Um, David, any, th any other thoughts? Well, that's exactly the guidance that they're giving is um, you don't argue your way to people getting vaccinated. Instead, is it's really about listening and understanding and um, giving you know the appropriate information um, whenever they do have misunderstandings, for example, about pregnancy and um, things such as that. You know, it's it, it it really is about a lot of listening. And what they found is is that is much more effective. I will say we do have a student group, Faith in the Vaccine Ambassadors. There are MSU students are, um, that have been specially trained in order to be able to communicate with other students. Uh, they are um, willing to go out and, and, and visit um, to groups and really to be able to answer those questions that may come up. And it's often a lot easier to hear and being able to hear that rather than somebody, um, you know, such as me that's telling me, man, I really encourage you to, and here's why they can talk about it as just another student about that. So we do have that available. Uh, you can reach out to the COVID response team and we can get you the contact person of the one heading that up. You know, uh, 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 David Hall and I both have people we love in our families that are not vaccinated. And, you know, you just, you just, um, you, you keep loving them and quietly you keep working on them. And you hope that over time, you know, when you're not able to go on an airplane without being vaccinated, when you're not able to go to a concert without being vaccinated, when you think about what could happen um, with their grandmother, if they, if, if they contracted it, you know, you just, you keep working. Uh, and, and for me, and I, and I know for David, we pray for them, um, to have a, to have a change of heart. Hey, Cliff, President Smart, may I speak? Yes. Um, you, you know, it, it's very interesting. I really appreciate your passion and your compassion, you know, for those, who have not been vaccinated. Uh, I too have family members who are not being vaccinated and refuse to get the vaccination. But I had an interesting conversation with a shuttle driver the other, the other day. And we were just talking about the fact that, you know, um, about the vaccination. And I told him that I had been vaccinated, but he told me he had not been vaccinated. But he also shared with me that, you know, uh, when he shared that with other people that he was being, um, criticized and, 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 and lambasted for not being vaccinated. And that really has no place. I mean, you, the point you made about the freedom of choice we have in America is, is pertinent, is relevant, but it has no place to, to really criticize people for what, what their beliefs may be. And I have a son who refuses to get vaccinated. I can only pray for him. I can only try to con convince him that vaccination is the way but I also will not criticize him uh, for not being vaccinated or wanting to get the vaccination for whatever his beliefs may be. And I think that's uh, particularly important. And I really appreciate uh, your compassion and your humanity, you know, not only towards all the, the, the victims of, of COVID-19, but for those of us or those of us who know folks who, who simply for whatever reasons simply don't believe in the vaccination. We can only encourage, cajole, persuade, and, and, and pray for them to, to, to see the light, to be vaccinated in order to decrease the adverse impact of this uh, pandemic on all of us. So I, I simply wanted to say that because that's a reality that many of our, the few of our staff who have not been vaccinated, they face and nobody should be criticized for what they believe. You know, we simply should try to work to convince them that there is a better way and that uh, the, the, the way of life over death sometimes is the way to go, but they shouldn't be uh, viciously criticized or castigated for what they believe. 
Wes, I might add to that comment as well. While I am as frustrated as many about the misinformation about vaccination and concerns about DNA alteration or tracking devices, et cetera, which, are, which is just nonsense, we also need to remember that there is a subset of our campus community members who cannot be vaccinated. We have people right now who are organ transplants, who cannot, uh, recipients who cannot get vaccinated. We have people who are currently undergoing treatment for types of cancer and they can't be, be vaccinated. And so while I appreciate the spirit of the question about trying to be part of the problem and encourage folks, we also need to be cautious because there are other reasons why people are not vaccinated. And while it is certainly legal to ask someone if they are vaccinated, it is far more legally um, murky about asking them why they are not, because if they are not vaccinated because of a disability, that is an inappropriate and illegal disability inquiry. So if someone says, I'm not vaccinated because I'm gonna grow a third arm, you can engage with them, but, but we should be cautious because we do have a few handfuls of folks who have disabilities or sincerely held religious beliefs that are at play. If, if I can add something too, many of you may know that we've been working with the CDC here recently trying to investigate issues of vaccine hesitancy. And yes, we found people who um, have had some imaginative um, ways of getting around the, the vaccines. Also, it, it's unfortunate that this, uh, the vaccines came out during a, a very um, divisive election, which has contributed to contributed a lot to this too. But I'm optimistic and some of the people that I've talked to in this uh, project that basically uh, many of them have some rational uh, reservations dealing with the FDA uh, approval. They want to wait for the FDA approval, which I think will occur uh, uh, relatively soon. They have some technology issues, uh, some questions about the technology that are rational questions that can be addressed in a rational discussion. So I'm optimistic that many of these people will change their minds very quickly uh, as soon as these are these issues are addressed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, David. You know, we're, we're getting we're getting 5000 new people a week vaccinated in, in Greene County. We, we continue to make progress on this. We expect FDA approval in the next three weeks. Uh, again, I, I think Dr. Claiborne's right. That'll help. And I, and I think we just, you know, continue uh, to show concern and care for our friends and coworkers and be encouraging and encourage them to talk to their physician. Um, and, and, and we'll make progress on this. Okay, I have a couple. We, we don't have much time left and we have a fair number of academic questions. All right, all so, right. Let, let's do two or three more and then we'll wrap up. And, and then maybe it can be at your faculty luncheon, uh, Dr. Ryan Hellig, that you might be able to answer them as well. How are faculty being instructed on course modalities? If the course is typically offered as a seated course, can faculty still decide to host courses virtually? Is there a process they must go through to have that request approved? And so what are the deciding factors? I take that, Cliff. Yeah. Um, the modality that uh, we're starting this semester with for the courses uh, should stay as it is, unless there is a major factor that is discussed and decided there is no alternative except for changing it, which could be, I, we had one of those today that uh, uh, it was sickness unrelated to COVID, but a sickness that had to be dealt with for the next few weeks, but could be carried on from the home as opposed to, um, you know, being in the classroom. Uh, but unless there's an accommodation, which then also would cause uh, the uh, mandating of a change, we're not just arbitrarily uh, suggesting people can change their course modality. Yeah. If, 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 if you believe your course modality needs to change, then you need to work through your department head and your dean and the provost office. If that that we have academic administration have collectively decided those need to be centrally made. They, they uh, you do not have the discretion to change the way you're delivering your class on your own. Okay, 
And uh, will the academic classroom policies be the same this fall as they were in fall 2020 and 20, spring 21 as it relates to flexibility with students, regardless of course modality, providing online course content, exams, et cetera? Frank? That's pretty broad in trying to answer it, but basically, <laughs> um, you know, we know we'll have some students that may be out in a larger number for a limited period of time. And I encourage everyone to have some compassion and kindness and make efforts to accommodate those students rather than a strict policy that says, no, you can't ever miss my class and there's a penalty and so on. However, that doesn't mean that it should be abused. Um, and we know that that always becomes a guessing game a little bit, but I do anticipate, especially at the start of the semester, that we will need the kind of flexibility that recognizes COVID is with us. We've made arrangements for a lot more capability in terms of being able to you know, take the Zoom lecture. We have 158 Zoom rooms capa uh, capable this fall going into the semester. Uh, so I would encourage everyone to take advantage. Um, if, you know, 10% of your students out, that may be a way to help them by having it a video taped and uh, made available to them. Now that doesn't mean that uh, that will solve all of their needs. It won't, but um, it means our faculty work a lot harder. And I think that's just uh, what we've been doing and we'll need to continue to do. Okay, and if I may, uh, we have a number of questions with regard to vaccinations, uploading cards, that type of thing. And we do have the uh, COVID vaccine or the COVID-19 site is still up and that uh, you can get to that on the web, on the homepage of the website. Uh, under there, you can see information under vaccines that instructs you how to do a number of those things. So uh, I think that's the, the best answer to a lot of the vaccination questions. In addition, um, we should have more information available in September with regard to third vaccinations, and we will provide that then on that site. Is that a fair statement, either Dr. Maggie or President uh, Vice or President Shaw, I think that's very well stated. Uh, it's literally evolving each day, and we're staying abreast of it, and we'll keep the web page updated. And if somebody is stymied or stopped on uploading their card or something, just call the medical records department of majors and we're happy to help uh, customize something for you. And, and, and let me let me encourage people. We, 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 we thought we did a really nice job communicating last year and we got feedback that we did. So, so you can send me an email directly Clifton Smart at MissouriState.edu. You can email Frank. You can email Chris Craig. You can email uh, any of us, and we'll work to answer questions. Let me encourage you: read Inside Missouri State. Really, uh, we we put we ha we have all every week. There's COVID information in there. Go to the COVID dashboard every day. You can look at the numbers. The policies are in there. The travel policies in there. Um, but we, Frank and I, are coming to college meetings. We're coming to de department meetings. We're coming to division meetings. We're the goal is for you to know everything. We do not hide the ball. We may not always make the perfect decisions, but we are not hiding in any information. We want you to know everything that's happening on campus, what the decisions are, the rationale behind the decisions. It's why, you know, David Maggie's involved in these, David Claiborne's involved in these, the whole academic leadership team. We meet every week to work through things. And the goal is to share information and decisions broadly, as well as to get your input. I can't imagine a, a university doing better on that than we are, but obviously we got criticism last year on that. And so, so check out all the information that's out there. And if you don't see it, send me an email. I'll get you an answer. I'll send it to the right person or I'll answer it myself. 
All right, it's 504. And on that, thank you everyone. We had over 800 people on for most of the call. Have a great semester. Know we're working on this every single day, every single week. And our focus is on both delivering our classes, having a great experience, but doing it in a safe manner. And we will work as hard as we can to accomplish those goals. Take care. I'll see the faculty at the luncheon tomorrow and we can continue the conversation there if you'd like to.